Good afternoon and welcome to our AIA Continuing Education webinar on the AIA Standards for Continuing Education Programs. My name is Stephen Martin. I'm the Managing Director of Professional Development and Resources at AIA National, which is just a long way of saying that I'm responsible for the group that manages the Continuing Education Program. This is our first webinar for providers for 2020. We have a whole series of webinars planned for you all this year, so if you go to the career section of AIA.org and the Provider Toolkit page, you'll be able to see a schedule of all of the different webinars that we have scheduled, the topics that we're planning to cover, uh, and other resources that are available to you as providers to help you do your jobs and really make sure that um, everything is working well. So before we get started, I just want to go through a few things that are on our agenda for today. We're going to be talking today really about the AIA standards for continuing education programs. These standards are now about a year old, so this may be uh, old hat for some of you, it may be new, but we're going to go through sort of a little bit of how we got to where we were, what the standards are, why we made the changes we made a year ago, and the different types of things that are covered in the new standards. What hasn't changed in the standards along the way, there are some things that are still the same as they've been since the program launched in the late 1990s. And then uh, what we see coming next down the road in terms of our standards and some other pieces. And we're going to leave plenty of time for Q&A as we go along. If you have any questions, if there are things that you're interested in knowing about, on the right-hand side of your screen, you'll see a QA window. At the bottom of that window, you can go ahead and type your questions in. When you get those questions in there, we'll uh, address them as we go along. Some of them I may not be able to hit until the end when we get to the Q&A section, but feel free to type them in as we go along throughout the entire presentation. So let's start with, with where we got, how we got to where we are today. Uh, for any of you that have been providers for more than a year or so, you may remember the old CES provider manual. The CES Provider Manual really started, the first versions were released when the AIA Continuing Education Program was launched in 1995-1996. That manual was an evolutionary document, like many things uh, in organizations. As different things came up, new stuff was just kind of put into it. Over time, there were pieces that were really focused on um, the policy and the rules, and a lot of those rules were developed or came about as a result of uh, people who broke the rules. So we would have a provider that did something that wasn't in keeping with the spirit of what we were trying to do. And instead of addressing the different things at different levels, we would put in a new rule. And we ended up with a provider manual that was lots of thou shalt and thou shalt not. And it became cumbersome. It was not very well structured because it, it grew over time and it wasn't very easy to find the things that you were looking for. The other thing that came about, because it's a document that started in the 1990s, it was built in software that existed in the 1990s and updated over time. It made it really hard to update the manual. It was originally developed in uh, software packages that didn't exist, so just from a, from a structural, functional point of view, we had a hard time keeping it up to date. In 2018, uh, 2017, 2018, we started to look at what we wanted to do with the continuing education program, and we realized that one of the things that was holding us back, honestly, was that, that CES provider manual. We wanted to come up with a more comprehensive set of requirements, of guidelines for our providers to follow. The focus really should be on quality content and not a list of rules and a list of different policies and regulations that, that you as providers have to comply with. We also wanted to make sure that we could provide clear details to you. We wanted it to be something that it would be easy for you to find the things that you're looking for. It would be something that we were hoping would be easy to reference so that when you had questions, we could quickly point you to the right part of the document. And we wanted it to be something that could adapt and change over time without it becoming unduly burdensome. The other piece that the new the new standards give us is it would allow us to align better with some of the things that were part of our strategic focus for the next three to six years, including new provider applications, how we conduct our provider audits, and then an accreditation process that we're working on. So the biggest thing is, is how the standards are structured. If you've got a copy of the continuing education standards for um, 
or the AIA Standards for Continuing Education Programs, which you can download on AIA.org on that provider toolkit page. And we'll make sure that everybody gets a, a, a link to where that is, uh, all the participants in the webinar today. But in that guideline, it's really broken down into two main sections. There is an introductory section that covers um, some terminology and the glossary of the terms that we use within the program. Uh, one of the things that we discovered along the way is that while we all were using the same words, we oftentimes had different understandings of what those words meant. So we wanted to make sure that when we were communicating about different things, for instance, what is a formative assessment versus a summative assessment, that we had a clear understanding that this is what we were referring to, and in the parlance of AIA continuing education, this is what that term meant. Next in there is, is some guidelines to our members about what continuing education is supposed to be about. So this covers things like when they can self-report, what the expectations are for members in terms of the education they receive. We included that in the standards document because we wanted you as providers to know what it is that our members were looking for or required to do as part of their continuing education piece. It is a two-part system. We have our providers who are the ones delivering the education, and then, of course, there are the people in the classroom who are receiving it. They have certain requirements and, and different things that they understand along the way. The bulk of the document, though, is focused on the standards that you need to be concerned with. And to make that easier, we broke it down by the phase or function uh, within this ES provider network. So there is a section on the general requirements and general standards. There's a section on developing programs. We have a section on presentation and how you, how you deliver the programs. Uh, there is a portion of it that's set in terms of how do we measure how long a program is, what qualifies for credit, what qualifies as a, as a question as part of a summative assessment, and so on. And then finally, the section on reporting. How quickly do you have to get information into us? What information do you have to keep? How long do you have to keep it? Each of the standards is numbered so that we can quickly reference them. And then when there are related elements to those, those are given subsections. So you'll see something like standard 14 covers a, a piece of information. And then under standard 14, there might be section 1402 or 1403. So if I were to look, for instance, at standard 14, which is marketing and other descriptive materials, under that, there are standards 1401, which is disclosing significant features of a program in advance. There is standard 1402, which is what you have to disclose in terms of what learners need to know before the class. And then 1403, which is how you can state that the course carries AIA continuing education credit. We put that numbering system in place so that along the way, again, as we need to reference things, we can quickly point you to where it is. We know that this guide will be a living document over time. We expect sometimes that pagination and things won't change. So instead of telling you to look at page 22 and trying to figure out if you've got the same version of the document or if your version is printed the same way ours does, we're going to point you to the standard number so that you can find that information. So what are the big changes that took place from what we used to do in the program uh, prior to January 1st, 2019, and what we do today? We have added in a limited ability for our members to self-report health, safety, and welfare programs. In the past, members have not been able to self-report anything and have it qualify for health, safety, and welfare. For you as providers, this is important to know because we want you to submit your courses to us for prior approval uh, so that when members take the courses, their attendance is recorded and all of those things that come from being a provider. The self-reporting aspect is really reserved for those places where there are courses or programs that are offered by organizations that, that just logically don't make sense to be providers. Uh, many government agencies, for instance, are unable to be a provider because there are certain laws or statutes on the books that, aren't, that don't allow them to become a member of an association like AIA. Um, while it's technically not membership in the true sense, they aren't allowed to be part of a system like the AIA continuing education system. The other uh, group that oftentimes is not a continuing education provider, because it's usually not considered continuing education, are accredited colleges and universities, and, and it's the degree programs within that. Some of you may be from accredited colleges and universities, but you're in the continuing education side of things. So it's non-degree programs, non-credit programs. We thought it was a little silly that you could sit in on a one-hour lunch and learn uh, and get credit, 
but if you went back and got a master's degree or a doctorate in architecture, be of above and beyond what you already had, that for some reason that wouldn't count. So we've opened it up so that if you take courses from a government agency or you take courses that are for credit from an accredited college or university, those can be submitted for health, safety, and welfare credit. They still have to meet the requirements of HSW. It still has to be about protecting health, safety, and welfare. It's just that these are the two exceptions for courses that don't have to come from an approved AIA CE provider. The other big change on our member side is that members may not repeat learning programs. Under the old guidelines, you could take the same course once every 12 months. This didn't make sense to us. If you take English 101, more than once, you don't get credit for it more than once. We hope that you've learned something from it, but you get credit for it the first time you take it. We've done the same thing. Where this will have an impact are on courses that may have updates based on the year. So for instance, a building codes course, where you have a 2019 buildings code course and you have a 2020 building codes course. In the past, we've had providers that have simply just updated some of the materials and continued to offer it as the same course with the same course number. What this new requirement for not repeating learning programs does is it says, you know, that 2019 course should have been its own standalone thing, and the 2020 course should have been submitted as a new course. The content is different. The subject matter is different. One was talking about the 2019 building codes, and the other is talking about the 2020. So there are differences between them. Related to that, as we get into the changes that impact our providers, learning programs may not be renewed. What this means is that when a learning program is approved by AIA for delivery, it is valid for AIA credit for three years or up to three years. At the end of three years, we used to allow providers to simply tell us, we want to keep continuing, we want to keep teaching this course, uh, so please go ahead and renew it. And we would just, on a blanket approval level, just say, okay, great, we're going to add another three years. As we did our migration to the CE dashboard in October of 2018, we discovered as we were trying to clean up some of our data, we had courses in our system that had been submitted in 1999, 2005, um, courses that were over 10, 15 years old that we have never looked at or touched since. But they have been renewed because the provider said, yeah, we want to keep teaching this. It's hard for us to accept, and it was hard for, for registration boards around the country to accept that a technical education course authored in the early 2000s had not changed enough that it should have been revised and resubmitted as a new course. Furthermore, our standards, our policies, what qualifies for continuing education have changed dramatically over the years. So in our new standards, a program is good for three years. At the end of three years, if you would like to continue teaching that course, and you know that the course still is valid, the course is still technically accurate, the course still has information that is useful and, and relevant to architects, then you may resubmit that course for another three-year approval. It has to be resubmitted as a new course, which means it gets a new course number, and it gets submitted to us so that we can take a look at it. And we do that because it's pushing you as the providers to make sure that you've evaluated whether the course is still accurate, and it gives you an opportunity to make adjustments and revisions. And then finally, it allows us to apply the standards that are in place at the time of the submission, not the time the course was first taught, but when the course is resubmitted for approval. So if for some reason standards have changed and a course that qualified three years ago no longer qualifies, we will be able to make those kinds of adjustments. And again, the bigger changes, we've revised, we've made clearer definitions in the beginning. Uh, we've done some things, we've listened to concerns that our providers have raised about advertising. So we are clarifying some of the things in our advertising section. Uh, one of them is, is to clarify the unit of measurement. We award learning units. We don't award CEUs, PDHs, CEHs, any other acronyms you may look at. AIA's courses are measured in what are called learning units, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. The other thing that we've heard is that there are times that you want to start your advertising before we've had a chance to completely review. Under the old process and under the old, under the old requirement, the guidelines, you were not allowed to advertise a course as an AIA course until it had been approved officially. What we have done now is we've added in the ability that you can advertise a course that has been submitted to us and is pending review as submitted for AIA CE credit. 
you may not say submitted for however how this many units and you may not say what type and we do this really to protect you if a course is submitted to us for instance for two lu hsw credits and upon review we look at it and we say you know what this is not hsw it's a good course but it doesn't qualify for hsw and then you look at it and say well actually it's only an hour and a half long and we change it from the two lu hsw that was originally submitted and it's finally approved for 1.5 lu elective we don't want you to be in the situation where you've advertised one thing people have come expecting that thing but what was actually approved is something different so you can say on something that is pending approval submitted for aiace credit that statement right there is allowed nothing else beyond that um, the other big change is that we have some shifts in the way that our platform providers work these are our providers that host other people's courses and how they will do reporting and course submission this is something that we're working on directly with our platform providers Some clarification on the whole learning unit piece. We looked at how we were using the term LU, and we realized that a learning unit really is a measurement. In the AIA world, a learning unit is equal to 50 minutes of instruction, so that first 50 minutes, and then after that, we base it on the full hour. So once you hit that, that LU, again, is the measure. Within that measure, there are currently two types of learning units. There are LUHSW, which are the courses that qualify for HSW credit, and then we have what we are calling LU elective. And the idea here, again, this was more of a, a thing for marketing on our point, our members are required to take 18 learning units a year. So they have to take 18 LUs. Of those 18 LUs, at least eight, or at least, I'm sorry, at least 12 must be HSW. They must be in health, safety, and welfare topics. The remaining credits, so the remaining six credits, can be in anything. They could be LU HSW or they can be what we're calling LU elective. These are courses that are germane to the practice and profession of architecture, but are not qualifying for the HSW designation. It doesn't mean that they're not as good. It doesn't mean that they're not as valuable. It just means that they don't carry the HSW credit designation. These are courses oftentimes in project management, in running the business of a firm. They could be things on some of the larger design issues. They're things that don't fall into protecting the health, safety, and welfare of the public, but they are important to what an architect does in practice. In the new standards, we also more clearly define the delivery types, and we've broken it down really into two main categories of delivery, live and on-demand. When you submit a course to us for approval and you start to fill out the form in CE dashboard, you will need to designate whether a course is a live learning program or an on-demand learning program. The key differentiator between the two, it's easiest to define what is live and then anything else is going to be on-demand. So a live course requires that the student and the facilitator are online or in person at the same time. What we are doing right now with this webinar is a, a live online program. It's live because I am delivering this to you as you sit and listen. If we were in a classroom, this would be a live in-person delivery because we were in the same place. The biggest thing is that the instruction is happening real time. The recording of this webinar, if it were to be put out for, for credit, would become an on-demand program meaning that the learner can take it at any time or any place. The learner can take it on demand. So within our live learning programs, we break them down into two types, and this will be what you would designate in the session information for the program. It will either be in person, meaning that you are physically located in the same place, or it will be online. In those circumstances where you may have a combination of those, for instance, you've got a live classroom, but you're also streaming it out to remote participants, you can determine which category you want this to fall in, whether you want it to call it in-person or online. A general rule of thumb with that is where do you have the most people? So if you have a room with 100 people live in, in the room with the instructor and you've got 15 or 20 who are remote, that can pretty much be considered a live in-person event. But if you have an event where there are 200 people who are connecting remotely and 15 in the room, then that one's probably going to be a live online. That differentiation is not important when it's mixed, but it does make a difference as you go through and create your sessions of some of those things. 
on-demand programs then are everything else. It's those things that learners can take at their at their own leisure. It's it's your traditional e-learning courses. It is uh, videos and things that have been recorded and replayed. It could be podcasts. It could be uh, webcasts and other things. This also includes the print other category. These are things like articles and magazines. Uh, your your actually kind of old school correspondence courses would fall into that print other category. The new standards also acknowledge two new types of learning. One of those is blended learning. And blended learning really, as it sounds, is just a combination of the other types. So if you've got a course that, for instance, has a kickoff that requires all of the participants come together in the same place for a uh, one-day workshop, and then after that workshop, they go back to their places of work, and there are modules that they need to complete on their own time, Maybe there are e-learning modules they complete. Maybe there are webinars that they have to watch. Maybe there are podcasts they listen to. And then you bring them together for some maybe some live online learning. Uh, and then finally have a capstone that's, again, another in-person event. That would be blended learning. There's a lot of power to doing this. There's a lot of different things you can do in terms of cohort education along these lines. All of those fall into acceptable learning methods. Our old policy guidelines really didn't know what to do with these programs. So we have updated the new standards to include sort of a, this is how we handle these blended things. The biggest change in terms of delivery types has been the inclusion of what we are calling nano learning. These are learning units. These are our courses and programs that are shorter than one hour. If they are 15 to 29 minutes long or 30 minutes long, they're going to be 0.25 learning units. If they are 30 to 45 minutes long, they're going to be 0.5 learning units. We don't have a 0.75 because once you hit 45 minutes, you need five more minutes and you're at a full LU. So we don't even bother with the 0.75. The one thing to keep in mind with nano learning, they are acceptable for AIA members to meet their AIA membership requirement for continuing education. Not all state boards, however, will accept classes that are shorter than one hour. You will need to make sure that any learners, any participants in your programs understand that they will need to check with their state board to ensure that the credits will count towards any mandatory continuing education licensure requirements in that state. Uh, we do know there's a handful of states where there are some questions in mind. Um, these are states that have specifically put into their guidelines that continuing education must be at least one hour long. Uh, we're working on compiling a list of those. We need to verify a couple of them with the state boards. Some of them have been things we've heard about anecdotally, uh, and other things are, are ones where we're aware. So we will be publishing a list of, of which states we know do not recognize that. Uh, we have worked with NCARB, which is the body that represents the registration boards. NCARB is, is in alignment with us that nano learning is acceptable. Uh, NCARB actually has considered doing some things on their own. Um, so they are also working with the state boards to try to encourage boards to accept these, these types of things. What types of things do you deliver by nano learning? Well, think about like TED Talks. Uh, think about single focus, single topic, very quick hit types of information, in-depth content on one specific subject or area. Nano learning for us can be delivered as in-person. So it could be a live event where someone is speaking. It could be streamed online, uh, so it's a live online, or it can be done as an on-demand piece. We do not allow nano learning for print-based courses. So you can't have a short article and have it count as a nano learning credit. Print-based articles, print-based materials, those things that are, are in that sort of static form uh, still have a minimum of a one LU length. Within the delivery types, this is not so much a change that came about with the standards, but this is a change that has come about with our launch of the CE dashboard. Within our delivery types, you must include a session. Under the old system, the old discovery system, you really didn't have to have more than one session. With the way we have set up a new CE dashboard, as you have any courses, any programs that are designated as live programs, you will need to create a unique session for each offering of the course. So if I have a live lunch and learn that I do, and I give that lunch and learn on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of this week, I will need to create four distinct sessions that are in line with the one that I did on Monday, the one I did on Tuesday, the one I did on Wednesday, and the one I'm planning to do tomorrow. 
That is so that we can reflect when and where these things are taking place. As we work on developing a more comprehensive catalog later this year, we will use that session information to be able to advertise to our members and to others who are interested in your programs when and where programs are going to be offered. You'll also note that within the sessions, you can designate whether they are private or public. So if you're doing a lunch and learn at a firm and the only people allowed to go to that lunch and learn are members of the firm, you would mark that private. That way, when we create a, an online catalog, we'll know not to display that. We'll have a record that the session took place. That's a record we'll see here at AIA, but it won't be published out. If it's a public session, then it's something that anybody is, is able to attend, and we'll want to get those out there and, and let people see them. For on-demand courses, those traditional e-learning courses and print courses, it doesn't make sense to have a, a unique session for each time it could be offered because it could be offered for as many times and as many places as there are learners who decide to take the course. So for on-demand, a single session can be used to handle all of those. And you'll know as you go into CE dashboards, you'll see the difference. When you are trying to report a live session, uh, it won't ask you the date because we already know it. It's the date that you included with the session. But when you go to record an on-demand session, it will ask you for what date the course completion was made. The other place we look seriously at, at our standards was really at how we assess learning and what sorts of things we require in learning. For our on-demand programs and our e-learning programs in particular, we are requiring and, and hoping that as good instructional design and as part of, a part of good learning, that you're including review questions and content reinforcement throughout the program. So that as someone progresses through different modules, for instance, in an e-learning program, they're given an opportunity to test whether they actually picked anything up or learned anything in that last module. These are not questions that go into a final grade. These are questions that are used to reinforce what was just taught, to help a learner figure out whether they actually understood what was just taught, and give them an opportunity to go back and review where needed. For on-demand courses, there is, however, a summative assessment requirement. This is that final quiz, final test. Under our old policies, you simply needed 10 questions, regardless of the length of the program. So if it was a one-hour program, 10 questions. If it was a three-hour program, 10 questions. If it was a 15-hour program, 10 questions. That didn't make sense. There's a lot of content you would cover in a long program, and it made sense to have a broader range of assessment questions there. So the number of questions that you're required to ask or required to include in an on-demand program will increase with the number of learning units awarded. This is not 10 for every hour. Uh, it works out a little different than that, and there's a formula in the standards to help you determine just how many questions you need to have. The other thing we've done is we've eliminated the use of true-false questions, or any other binary choice questions. These really aren't assessing learning. You are just as likely to get these correct flipping a coin as you are actually understanding the content. So from an instructional point of view, these are not ways to assess whether learning has taken place. And then the final piece, which I hope should be clearly understood, and from an instructional point of view, I hope no one has gone the other way with this, but your questions on your final test, that final assessment, need to assess the learning objectives of the class. Why did we include this? Well, we didn't put these things in here, and this will give you an idea of, of why we had to revise some of our, our criteria. Under our old policies, we said you have to ask 10 questions in order to assess whether people had learned things. Because we didn't clearly state in the, stand, in the, in the policies that the questions had to assess the stated learning objectives, we had people that would do things and ask questions like, what is your name? What's your email address? Can we contact you for additional information or to give you more information about our products and services? Those are not questions that we're assessing learning. That was lead generation. And when we pushed back on some providers that were doing these sorts of things, the answer we got was, well, your standards don't say we can't do this. Your standards just say we have to ask 10 questions. So that's why you'll see some of these things here so we can get back to the spirit of what the program is for and why we asked for that summative and final assessment piece. As we've entered into a new era of instruction and training, we really wanted to look at encouraging providers to think differently about how they deliver 
courses. We wanted to move away from the traditional model of the expert who stands behind a podium and reads from a PowerPoint slide deck. That works. There are times that's appropriate. This webinar, for instance, fits into that model perfectly, and we hope that you're getting information out of this. But we also know that there are other ways that we can teach people and other ways that people can learn effectively. But our old policies, our old standards didn't allow ways to do that sort of creative thinking. We still have to calculate in learning units. Whether we like it or not, it's a convenient measure. Seat time seems to work. For live courses, that's really easy. How long is the learner in the room? How long is the learner sitting there? If you base your calculation on the expected seat time, you know it's a one-hour lunch and learn, it's going to be a one LU course. That's simple and straightforward. Where it gets confusing as we move into on-demand courses and as we look at doing different things like gaming or, or different sorts of adaptive learning things, in those programs, it's possible that two people could complete them in completely different amounts of time. If I have a gaming application, an educational game, for instance, I might be able to, to successfully complete that game to reach the state that is considered success uh, in, in an hour. Somebody else might do it in 25 minutes. Another person might do it and take four days. So how do we figure out how many hours to award? We can't do it by their actual seat time because then everybody would take four days. But we need to have a, a comprehensive way to do this. So we looked at two different ways. One method is to use a pilot test. So in this method, you would take at least three people from your representative audience. So in this case, we would hope three architects. Put the program in front of them. Don't give them an idea of how long it should take. Just put the program in front of them. Tell them what they need to achieve to be successful or, or to pass, and then sit there with a stopwatch and figure out how long it takes them to do it. So if one person takes 25 minutes and another person takes an hour and someone else takes two and a half hours, you take the average of those three times, and that will give you the number of LUs to award. So if the average of that comes out to an hour and 15 minutes, then it's going to be a one LU course. If the average of the three pilot test people come out to be two hours, then it's going to be a two LU course. And it doesn't matter then going forward if five of the people who take it take seven hours and six of the people take 25 minutes. If most of the people continue to take that one or two hours, then we, we know we have a good measure. The second way goes back to the more traditional method of the word count. Uh, and this is also how we would do things for an e-learning course. The word count formula here looks complex. It's really not. We're taking the number of words, say in a print article, and we're dividing it by 180. 180 is about the words per minute that a, that a person can read in technical documents and technical, technical documentation. Architecture texts tend to fall into that category, so that's where that 180 comes from. If you've added in audio, video, things that have a set duration, so there's a six minute video, you would put in the duration time of that media. And then we also give credit for the number of questions that you're asking. So if you have a 10 question quiz at the end, you're going to get an, you're going to get 18.5 added onto that because we figure that questions will take an average of 1.85 minutes for someone to answer. You take all of that, you divide it by the 50 minute hour that creates an LU, and now you get your answer. So it, it looks like a complex formula. It's really not. If you ever have any questions about it, please reach out to us. We can help you with those calculations. So let's get into the part that has caused the most concern over time. This is the definition of health, safety, and welfare. Since we have launched the new standards in January of 2019, so we're a little over a year in, this is the place that I think most people have struggled. I want to start out by saying that the primary intent of the HSW definition has not changed. The key part of the definition that you see on your screen is the sentence that said, learning programs must address knowledge intended to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the occupants of the built environment. The occupants. These are the people who will be the end users. These could be people that pass through, pass by, use the building. It's not the design professional. It's not the architect. It's not the contractor. It's not the owner. Those are the things to keep in mind. That has not changed. That has always been the intent of the health, safety, and welfare definition. It has always been about protecting the public good. What has changed is at our end, we are being much more stringent about requiring that you're explicit in telling us when something 
and how something protects health, safety, and welfare. We do have webinars that are scheduled later in this year that will more clearly and more, more fully cover the health, safety, and welfare definition. So I'm not going to go into a lot of real discrete examples right now, but just be aware that the biggest thing we're looking for is how does the content of the course make the public healthier, safer, or better off? If you can answer those questions, if you, if you can point us to where there is a direct connection to that health, safety, and welfare of the occupants, then the course is most likely going to be able to approve for HSW. If it is a long, convoluted, twisted path to get there, then it's probably not going to be approved for HSW. The other thing we did with the HSW definition is we clarified. We used to have a laundry list of terms, about 27 different terms with lots of keywords in them about the things that qualified for health, safety, and welfare. Some of our providers got really smart. They started copying and pasting from that list and putting it into their learning objectives, into their descriptions, whether they applied or not, and then saying, well, look, we, we got the right words in there. We, we mixed it all up. Um, we refer to this lovingly on our staff as the word salad approach, where people would just sort of kind of dump things in and hope that it would slip through. Uh, we are looking closely at what you write and you submit. We pick up on those things. So within the HSW definition now, after it's passed that first step, which is the does it, does it clearly look at protecting health, safety, and welfare of the public, we then say does it fall within one of these categories or divisions. These divisions are aligned with the same divisions that NCARP uses in the architectural record exam and the architectural experience program. So basically, if these are the things that a prospective architect needs to know before he or she can be licensed, then it only makes sense that these are the areas and topics that those who are licensed continue to develop throughout their practice. The important thing to remember when you look at these definitions here, these don't exist isolated from the prior slide which talked about that bigger definition of protecting the public good. Just because something falls under project management, if it doesn't address how project management makes the public healthier, safer, better, then it's not going to qualify for HSW, even though it's a project management course. So just because it falls into one of these six categories, if it hasn't passed the first test, it still won't be HSW. Before we move on, again, if you have questions along the way, feel free to use the Q&A pod over to the right-hand side. Just type your questions in, and I'll be able to see them. But I'm going to go ahead and move on now. Um, additional changes in our, in our standards, we would hope that this is something that you've been doing from the very beginning, but we wanted to make sure to state it explicitly. We want you to have subject matter experts involved in the development of your courses. It makes sense that you should have somebody that knows what they're talking about help you write the content. We highly advise that you involve an architect, whether that's reviewing the content after the fact, being the subject matter expert, if appropriate, along the way, but you are developing courses that are targeted for architects and design professionals. Who better to help you with that than an architect or design professional? They can help you know whether you're going to be reaching the audience the way that you expected, whether the content fits with what they would expect to see. Content, again, one of these things that I would hope that is very clear, content must be instructional. That means that it has to be educational. It can't be sales material. It can't be marketing material. It can't be advocacy material. It has to be instructional material. It has to be about teaching somebody about your topic. We highly, highly encourage you, and we have set up our standards in ways to help make this easier. We encourage you to explore new approaches. Look at instructional games. Look at blended learning. Look at nano learning. Look at all of those different ways that go beyond the simple bringing a person in, having them stand behind a podium, and deliver that same PowerPoint presentation that they've done 500 times before. We've all been through those things. We know that they aren't always the most engaging. There's good information there, and it is, it is definitely possible to learn from those things, but there are other opportunities, tours are a great opportunity, plant tours to see how things are put together. Hands-on activities, you know, if, if you have, if you are doing fenestration and windows and you want to show an architect 
basically how something works, have them frame out a window. Have them put the window together. Look at all the different parts and pieces. Look at how you can use the different tools and, and let people participate and engage beyond just what would be in a slide deck. So let's talk about what hasn't changed. Uh, very simply, submission requirements haven't changed. You are still required to report or to submit courses to us for approval at least 10 days before your course is scheduled to go on. Our review process takes up to 10 days, business days, for us to review a course. That does not include any time if we have to send it back to you for more information. So you want to make sure that you plan ahead and you're submitting your course in a timely fashion so we have the opportunity to review. Typically, our review queue is far less than 10 days. We have had points in time when our review queue is two days, but that is completely dependent on the volume of submissions we receive. Last year, our reviewers approved more than 36,000 courses. So we're receiving a lot that we have to look at. When we have to turn courses around and ask for more information, it means we're actually reviewing in a given year far more than 36,000. So plan ahead. Uh, a failure to plan on your part will not lead us to uh, basically make things go faster. We can't expedite courses. We have 3,300 providers who are submitting 36,000 courses or more to us a year. Uh, so we can't make special exceptions. You've got to think ahead and you've got to know, hey, I've got this course coming up at the end of the month. I need to get that in early so that I can know that it's been approved. Your attendance reporting is equally vital to us. As an AIA continuing education provider, you are required to submit attendance within 10 days, 10 business days of successful course completion. We track this. If you would like to go through our audit process, the number one way to get yourself audited is turn in your attendance late over and over and over and over again. That will raise flags for us. We will look the other way or we'll give you a little bit of a, of a leeway if you're at you know, 11 days, 12 days. But when we see attendance coming in at 30 days, 60 days, 120 days, I think one of our most egregious is an entire course that we've reported 320 days after the event, that's unacceptable. And that, that is outside of the parameters of our program. This is important because our members are taking these courses not just for their AIA requirements, but in many cases to meet state regulatory licensing requirements. Having accurate information on their record in a timely fashion is critical. Having that information put in within that 10 days is absolutely essential. The other thing that will get you onto the audit list very quickly is to use your continuing education sessions as a blatant marketing or sales event. Continuing education is supposed to be about educating architects. It's not selling them products. It's not developing leads. It's not disparaging a competitor. It is about teaching them things. One of the important things for you to remember as providers, especially those of you that represent building product manufacturers, our research shows that building product manufacturers will have their products specified by architects more often because of good continuing education than any other method or any other channel. More important than your website, more important than marketing pieces, more important than product samples. Continuing education is the number one source that our members go to to learn about market segments and to learn about product categories. Notice that I said segments and categories. I didn't say the specific products themselves. They're looking at learning about these different things, and then when they find a good vendor, a good provider, someone who has taught them well, their products actually tend to be specified more often because they're seen as a trusted partner and an advisor. Please, our members are savvy. Our members are very quick to report to us when they don't see this. Differentiate between your marketing pieces and your education pieces. During the educational portion of a program, you need to refrain from anything that could be seen as marketing or sales of your products. So let's look at what we've got. The standards went into effect a little over a year ago, so January 1st, 2019. All new programs coming in since then have been evaluated using the new standards. And again, we've evaluated well over 36,000 courses at this point using the new standards and guidelines. 
any programs that were approved prior to January 1st, 2019 will continue to be valid until their three-year life cycle expires. We are actively working on a provider accreditation model that will look at your understanding of the standards and your capability to deliver the type of training and education that we're looking for from AICS providers. The accreditation process is going to be looking at really four areas. Your administration of the program. Are you submitting courses in a timely fashion? Are you submitting your tenants in a timely fashion? Do you have a document retention policy in place and so on? We'll be looking at how you develop courses. Are you using subject matter experts? Are you reviewing your course evaluations to see if content needs to be updated and all of those pieces? We'll look at your delivery options. Who do you have teaching your courses? Are you just grabbing people off the street and giving them a slide deck, or are you prepping them to be able to understand what it is they're actually talking about? And then finally, we'll look at your evaluation data in terms of how you're maintaining and managing your course pieces. We are anticipating launching that later this year as part of um, and, and before our renewal cycle for 2021. Concurrent with that, we'll also be updating our new provider application process so that new providers coming in will have to answer all the same questions that, that you'll have to answer as part of the accreditation process. So what resources do they have to make sure that, that they can run the program? And the idea behind that, we're, we're not looking to, to filter people out completely. We're not looking to kick people out of the program. What we're really looking is just to make sure that anybody who is part of the provider program has an understanding of the baseline qualifications and what it takes to deliver good continuing education. Um, some people have realized that we've had providers that have left the program because they've said, this is just not for us. We're not ready yet to, to do these sorts of things. Whereas we've had other providers that are like, this has been the greatest thing for us. You know, we've developed relationships with architects. We've, we've seen an increase in our product specifications. Uh, we've got people coming to us, asking us for our expertise, and it, it's, really, it's really helped us along the way. So with that, we've got about uh, 10, 15 minutes left. I'm going to open it up. If you have any questions, again, you can type them into the QA pod over on the right-hand side. Um, I'll stay around. Again, we're here till the, till the top of the hour. Um, I'm not seeing any questions come through, but go ahead, and, and if you've got questions now, go ahead and feel free to submit them. If you have questions you think of later or things that you want to ask, the best way to get in touch with us is to use the email on the screen, ces at aia.org. That is probably the, the number one way to get to us. That goes into our ticketing system, and we can route that appropriately so the right member of staff can get back to you with an answer to your questions. So I do see a question here that says, if you choose to retire a course, how can you change the status to retired? Um, right now, you can't. But that is something that is on our enhancement list um, early on this year, is we will be adding in a, an ability for you as the provider to change the status from approved to retired. That is different from expired. A retired course can be brought out of retirement, whereas an expired course is done. Um, we hope to have that out there soon. Uh, right now, you don't have that, and, I, and my apologies to you. Uh, we know that right now it means that you have a very long list, especially if you've got courses that you know you're only going to teach one time and never again. They're still going to show up on that active list for three years. Okay, we've got a question here. Um, they're a registered CE provider, but the link doesn't show their, their provider secondary contacts. Um, or the link doesn't show you up. Megan, go ahead and, and send a note to CES at AI.org, and we'll go ahead and take a look at that. That's probably a setting within our, um, our association management system, so we'll, we'll make sure that you've got those connections there. This is a good question. What happens if you, you submit your attendees after 10 days? We often get this question from providers that say, hey, it's been more than 10 days, so I can't submit the attendance, right? No, no, no. Please submit the attendance. I would much rather have attendance submitted late than not at all. Our members would much rather have their attendance submitted late than not at all. What will happen if you submit your attendees after 10 days, though, is that we do run reports and we do look at providers that consistently and egregiously are submitting courses late. If you have one or two attendance records that get submitted late, that's okay. We're not going to come after you and audit you for that. If you've got, and we know there are those stragglers, for instance, we, we get them on our own things, the people that say, hey, I, I was at your conference last May, and I was just looking at my, my record, and I realized that I attended three classes that aren't there. 
it's now you know March 2020 and it was May 2019 when I took them. Um, can you go ahead and put these on my transcript and we'll get them entered in. Uh, that that does that shouldn't look bad for us since we're now almost a year late. Um, we understand that those sorts of things happen. What we're really looking for when we audit is if you have a consistent pattern that entire classes are not being reported for 15, 20, 30, 40 days. That's an issue. Question here, can non-AIA members attend a continuing education course and be issued certificates of completion? Yes, absolutely, absolutely yes. Um, our courses, our approval of courses, AIA's approval of courses, are recognized by nearly every NCARB jurisdiction. So the 57 US jurisdictions that license architects, by and large, accept AIA's designation, AIA's approval, as approving continuing education for architects for license renewal. We know that there are non-AIA members who will come to courses looking for the AIA approval because they need it to maintain their own license status. For those people, as providers, you are required to issue them a certificate of completion upon request. Within our standards, there are guidelines as to what needs to appear on that certificate of completion. Um, many of the elements on that are based on elements that are required by one or more states. Uh, for instance, Colorado requires that if the course has a grade, the certificate should state what grade they received uh, in the course. So we've added that into our standards as what should appear on the certificate of completion. But yes, non-AI members, anybody, can attend a course, um, and upon request, you should issue them a certificate of completion. So we have a question, is a learning unit equivalent to one hour or 50 minutes of content? This is a little bit tricky. Um, so, so I will go through a simple explanation and then the more details are within the standards document. If it is an on-demand course, you will see that the, the formula, the word count formula divides things by 50. So for an on-demand course, every 50 minutes qualifies as one learning unit. For a course that is in person, the first 50 minutes counts as a learning unit. Thereafter, it's each full hour will count as an additional full learning unit. So we don't, we don't do 50 minute hours for the, for the remaining hours. So if a course is an hour and 20 minutes long, it is gonna qualify for 1.25 LU. If a course is an hour and 30 minutes long, it's going to qualify for 1.5 LU. And again, within the standards, there are examples there for um, how, you can, how you can calculate that based on seat time. Uh, we are, the question here is, will this presentation be available on demand uh, so that it can be shared with others in, in your organization? We are um, recording this, so we will get it posted out there. We are also working on a continuing education platform for our providers that will cover things like administering the program, uh, crash courses in how to do good development, and crash courses in being better facilitators and presenters. Um, but yes, we will, have, we will have recordings for this available. Again, if you go to the providers page on AIA.org, you'll be able to get a list of upcoming webinars as well as resources and links to training guides and recordings of other webinars, including this one that we've done. Okay, question. Are assessments required for live in-person courses? No. Today, assessments are not required for live in-person courses. They are only required for on-demand courses. That doesn't mean you can't give an assessment with an in-person course, but you are not required to give one. Um, the reason it's not required is the, the idea behind the assessments is to gauge and understand learning. And our hope is that in a live setting that the instructor, the facilitator, is sort of feeling the, 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 the room and gets an idea of, of when, when people are sort of lost and when they need additional reinforcement. The other reason we don't do an assessment with a live course is that we know that the participants will have the opportunity for Q&A like this and can get clarity and clarification on things where they're confused. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions come through. Uh, I'm gonna stay on the line for another few minutes. And then, um, you know, at this point, if you wanna sign off, feel free. I'll take any other questions as they come in. I see one more coming through. Um, Providers have a speaker agreement form, and it's do you have to have a new one signed each time a new course is added or expired, or can the new ones be filed quarterly or more? So the speaker agreement is actually a document you keep on file. It's something that we will request in the event of an audit 
so that you need to have it. But we don't, we, you don't need to file those with us. We don't have a mechanism, quite frankly, where we can track and, and, and do all that for all the different speakers you have. So on the speaker agreement form, there is a place on that form that you can add in the courses they're teaching. So when an instructor or facilitator teaches a new course, you can add it to their existing form um, and keep that on file with you. So really, it's whenever they're teaching new things, just add them to that list. In the event that you are audited, that is a piece of information that that speaker agreement form is something that we could ask to see as part of the audit process. So once again, thank you all very much for your time today. Uh, I appreciate you being here. And, and take a look again at the AIA.org provider page site. You will get a listing of all of the other webinars that we're doing this year. We hope to see you there. If you have any questions along the way, if there are things you need clarification on, by all means, reach out to us at ces at AIA.org.